We're back here for another edition of Auto Insiders, and I have with me one of my all-time favorite people, the F&I goddess herself, and the hostess for Auto Finance Sense, Miss Kimberly Klein. Miss Kimberly, how are you today? Hi, Ray. It is so good to see you, well, especially looking as good as you look today. Oh, my God. You say things like that, and I'll sign anywhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ray. Well, thank you for being a part of this new nonsense that we're trying to do. But I do have to ask you a question. And, okay. And I sort of kind of prepped you for this question uh, before we went on the air, and I prepped you for this question like 10 seconds ago. So the question <laughs> basically is, everybody knows you as Kimberly Klein, the, the finance and insurance goddess, okay? But you know what? There was a Kimberly Klein before that. Who Who is Kimberly Klein? I mean, who are you? Where'd you come from? How'd you, how'd you get to be a big part of my life? <laughs> <laughs> oh right um well i was born no i'm not gonna start there i i will start um what i did before i got into automotive okay so maybe that'll help um before i get into automotive i was living in cleveland ohio and uh raising my son um i was the manager of a mortgage title company okay and so that mortgage title company asked me to open a branch in Baltimore, in Ellicott City, Maryland, um, just outside of Baltimore. Yes, beautiful area. Yeah, it, it really yes. is. Um, now, I'm originally from a tri-state area of northern West Virginia, so West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. Gotcha. And so lots of family living back here. My son at the time had an opportunity to go abroad and do some schooling. Mm -hmm. So when he did that, then I came back home and I opened up that branch in Ellicott City for a mortgage title company. So that's a lot of paperwork. Yes. It's a lot of loans that you're going through. Um, a lot of compliance. A lot <laughs> of compliance, yes. Yeah. And I had done this for about 12 years prior. Okay. So now I'm opening up a branch in Ellicott city. Okay. Um, but it was also a lot of driving for me, Ray, and you know, the roads around here, they're terrible to take, <laughs> yeah, to take <laughs> 70 into the city every day took me over an hour mm. and that's on a good day. Yeah. And boy, did that really, you know, <sighs> It didn't take too long before I realized this is not for me. And so my mother was at the time working for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Okay. She knew old Mr. Hamilton, rest his soul, old Mr. Hamilton, who owned Hamilton Nissan in Maryland. Gotcha. And said, hey, why don't you go ask old Mr. Hamilton if you can get a job there? And so in I went. And uh, that's where I got thrown into automotive finance management at the end of a month, right? Uh -huh. In springtime. It was in March and it was the uh, end of the month. And boy, they, yeah, they threw me in and said swim. And apparently you and did. I, <laughs> I, oh my goodness. There were so many times I was barely holding my head above water, but that's where I started was at a Nissan store in 2002. Um, and it was because I had a lot of, like you said, compliance mm -hmm. and tons of paperwork, um, loans, a, a loan background as well. Sure. And that's how I, I just got thrown into it. I never sold cars. I was never a sales manager. Okay. Um, I went straight into F and I. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and to do that in March, which is for those that don't know, March is the absolute beginning of the spring selling season. And March is one of the busiest months, especially on the East coast, um, in the automobile industry. It is, it, it, it's like come March 1st, it, somebody hit a switch that said, okay, customers will have to come back in now. And, and thousands of them do. And so to not have 
a lot of training for the F and I side of things to be thrown into that at the end of a month like March must have been absolutely oh, yeah. crazy. I, I mean, I, I would imagine your arms must have been tired from trying to stay <laughs> yeah. afloat. As they say in the business, hanging paper. Uh, yep, my arms were very tired hanging paper. And um, But I'll tell you, I learned really fast. Uh -huh. I learned to love it. And Ray, I was much younger then. Um, so I had lots and lots of energy <laughs> and enthusiasm to do that job and 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 did did you find that energy and enthusiasm waning over time i know <laughs> i did yeah. in the sales side of things and sales manager side of things it was like oh my god why am i doing this <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah. um, absolutely now let me ask you a silly question if i can because sure. I, i'm nothing if not silly questions so in in mortgage titles and all that, I mean, and compliance, there must have been times where, I don't know, people signed for things and maybe they weren't as truthful as they should have been, or maybe something wasn't as compliant as it should have been. Can you recall any times in, in the mortgage title company side of things where like there was a, a giant ass issue that popped up and it was like, oh my God, how do we get this corrected? Well, there's always a form for that, Ray. Yes. There's a form for errors everything. and omissions. Errors and omissions. That's right. But I will share an experience with you because I went through um the nineties mm -hmm. in Cleveland. Okay. And that's whenever um Oh my gosh, the prices were just skyrocketing and people were just sucking the equity out of their out of their homes mm -hmm. to pay off credit card yes. debt. And I can remember um people I I I swear to you, I kid you not, I especially remember one woman that was literally in the office once a month. Re she refinancing. Was doing it. Refinancing to pay off more credit cards and I remember her mortgage broker um, taking her credit cards from her and putting them in the freezer <laughs> and telling her you cannot have these anymore because she would, you know, pay them all off, mm -hmm. then go shopping. Oh my goodness. And, but at the time, um, it got to the point with appraisers in the mortgage industry where they no longer had to appraise, right? Yeah. Um, mortgage title companies could pick up the phone, call the appraiser and say, Hey, we need $215,000. And then they, they would sign off on it. And so the mortgage industry mm -hmm. was crazy. And out of that, I, I left short close to 2002, yeah. but past that, um, was a big predatory lending shakedown mm -hmm. in Cleveland in the mortgage industry. Now, remember, I'm on the title side yes. of it, not the lending or broker side, but it was all the brokers and we knew all the brokers. They're the ones that would give us the business. Did, and so it was crazy. It was just crazy back then. Did, did uh, I'm going to ask you a question and you can choose not to answer this. And the only reason I'm asking this question is because I really don't know, but do, do, title companies kick back money to uh, real estate agents who say when they close a deal, oh, well, well, we should use this title company for closing. Um, because obviously that's how a title company makes money. They, they do the paperwork and they collect the fee for doing the paperwork, but they also issue the issue, the title insurance. And, um, I'm, I'm guessing that th there's money to be made in issuing title insurance. So is, 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 is it the type of industry where, where title companies go out and say to brokers, Hey, do me a favor. Uh, let's close the deals here. We'll handle all the paperwork. I'll kick you back $250 for doing that. Did, does that type of stuff happen? It did back then. Yeah. Yeah, it did back then. Um, of course, as a title company, you had to go out and shop brokers and you wanted to be the cheapest, but the best. Yes. Now, this again is also whenever we were 
physically going into um, different courthouses and getting the paper. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't anything online. Yeah. Very, very few documents uh, um, or chains that you could find online. But whenever we would go out looking for new brokers to use our service, it was always a very, very nice lunch. And we will cut you a deal uh -huh. on our fees. Okay. Okay. And so that's generally how that works. The give and, but, the give and take, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. We'll cut you a deal on our fees if you use us for the next six months on X amount number of loans. Gotcha. I, I was I, I was just curious as to how that worked. Yeah. And and you know, I I don't know this and I as you know, I spent forty three years in, in the car business. But it you might know better than I do. I mean, banks come in to dealerships, bank reps come into dealerships, and they're looking to, well, buy more paper. They want you to send them more paper. Do you know of any finance managers that might have gotten a kick back from a bank representative other than that nice lunch they would take him to when they would come in um, <laughs> to, to get them to send more <laughs> paper their way. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't. Okay. I have not read. Okay, good. Um, Me neither. I was just curious. No, <laughs> no. no. Um, I, I can remember our PNC rep. Um, who would always come in and I'm like, where's the nice pens? Give me the nice pen. I would love those pens. And, you know, as time went on, that dwindled and dwindled and you got less and less and less. Yes. They would come in and visit you and, and you want at least a nice lunch. That's how it used to be. But, you know, by the time I left, we were lucky to get a pen. Wow. So no, we, no, that does not happen. That is non-compliant. Um, you know, and compliance is such a big thing, as you and I both know. Um, now, speaking of compliance, I, I'm going to share a story with you, if it's okay, okay. Um, about, oh, I got two great stories about that. Oh, I have so many stories about that. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm going to share a story with you uh, about a Nissan F&I person. Um, uh-huh. And when Nissan first came out with their first time buyer program, which was in the eighties, I think. And, and in order for somebody to qualify for a loan through Nissan's first time buyer program, they, they just had to have a clean credit report. Absolutely nothing negative on it. Mm -hmm. Now we got a notice from NEMAC one time that there, it turned out there was an issue and, and so, you know, well, what's the issue? And, and the issue was, well, this customer was presented to us as being a first time buyer. And when we really checked after we bought the loan, it turns out that there were two inquiries at the, at, at the credit bureau, credit bureaus that day, one under her real name that, that brought up horrible credit and then one under the truncated name in which the credit application was written and submitted to us um which came back with no credit so we approved the loan and their question Oops. to us was well uh how how would you like to pay us back for this loan uh, you know because our our finance manager took it upon himself to say i want to get this deal done um, mm -hmm. yeah, she's got a completely different name now. Uh, <laughs> have, have, have you seen anything like that in your career? Not that you would do anything like that, but have you seen others that were F and I managers or sales managers or even salespeople pull, try and pull stuff like that? I mean, I've seen a lot tried, uh, not exactly that yeah. scenario that you just gave, Oh boy, do I have stories. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but you know, I have to share. I mean, I've seen finance managers pull all kinds of things, right? That's interesting. Yeah. I've often, um, especially in the early days, had people come in with different names. Yes. All kinds of different names. And luckily, we've gone through a time where, you know, um, do you remember the day, Ray, when identity theft wasn't a thing? Um, you mean be 
b- before identity theft? Yeah, <laughs> I, I hell, I re- I remember the day. Okay, you're you're not going to believe this, but I remember the day where I would actually take a credit application from a customer. I would ask them their name and their, I would fill out the credit application. Oh, yes. Now wait a second. Yes. Wait a minute. This it's, this this gets even better. <laughs> this was before fax machines. So what we had to do is we actually had to call the bank. Okay. And we had to okay. call our buyers and and the buyer would sit on their side of the phone and say, what's the customer's name? And they would fill out the credit application on their side. So you would have to spell everything out. Oh, my uh, gosh. The, the name, the date of birth, the social security number, everything. Every, I mean, and and uh, and I'll never forget the name of the gentleman that was the buyer at the bank. I don't know if he's still alive or not. Dick Peterman, um, or as I used to call him, Dick Peter person. Um, and and I would I would have to read the application to to him every time we submitted an app. So you know, literally, it took ten or fifteen minutes, not ten or fifteen seconds, to get mm-hmm. an app submitted. It yeah. yeah, that was crazy. It was crazy. We used to fax fax now i was there when we there was a fax uh-huh. but albeit it was thermal paper fax uh-huh okay so we're talking early fax machines here thermal paper i, I got and even earlier had, but go ahead <laughs> yeah, you're like pre-fax <laughs> <laughs> but when we got fax machines and we had thermal paper and um yeah we had to fax the applications over now as you said we would write the information down what's your name mm-hmm. what's it you know we did that. Yes. Not the not the customer exactly. on a computer screen or anything. No, we did that. Yes. Um did, did, but, did you change uh, your policies later as opposed to having salespeople uh, ask the questions and fill out the credit application? Did you change it to uh you would hand the credit application to the customer and have them fill it out so that if yeah. there was any fraud on there, it was their fraud, not your fraud? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can definitely see if we had a timeline, Ray, you can see how the process has changed mm-hmm. over over time. And then what would happen is um, everybody would get up and leave the table after, okay, so we're going to hand over the application so the consumer can fill it yeah. out. Yay. But then everybody gets up and leaves the table and there's a credit application <laughs> laying on the table in the showroom. And then what happens after that? Well, we've got new processes coming out too. So it's definitely a timeline. I really like where we are now. It, um, it, and what is it that you like about about the process today as opposed to 2002 when you started or, well, like in the prehistoric <laughs> times when I started? Yeah, it was, it's, it's, I like it because it's tighter as far as lending goes and the processes in good dealerships and mm-hmm. compliant dealerships um all the time we see new companies coming mm-hmm. out with really great technology um on just knocking out identity theft at the dealership because i i know that people have no idea mm-hmm. um like the shred box yeah you know we all had a shred box well, well um, you know the- you you worked before shred boxes and so did i yeah, I was just going to say that before the shred box, it was the trash can. And, um, you know, people would come in and take the trash out at night. And so we've just come so far. And I love seeing the new technology that's going into um, dealerships to make that less and less of a thing. The, the, the thing so that, that people are protected. The thing that amazed me more than anything, um, you know, because I started in the business in 1977. Um, so, you know, that that was really a long time ago. And the amount of time it took to get a deal approved, you know, we we literally, we take the credit app, then, you know, I'd call Dick Peterman, yeah. I'd repeat everything to him. And then, and then if we were lucky, the next day we got an approval. It wasn't yep. like he got an approval today. And, and 
And then once we got the approval for whatever the amount was, and, and let's say somebody was financing $5,673.89, okay? Doesn't sound hard, except in those days, literally, uh, you had a, a book, a, a notebook type of thing, and mm -hmm. it had various interest rates. 3%, three percent, three and a half, three and a quarter, whatever it was. So if if somebody was approved for five thousand six hundred and seventy-three dollars and eighty-nine cents at three percent, you would turn to the page in the book that was three percent, and then you would look up five thousand dollars, and you would have to see what the charge was for five thousand dollars, what the what the char interest charge was, and you'd have to write all that down. Then you'd have to go to uh, seven hundred dollars. Then you'd have to go to seventy dollars. Then you'd have to go to three dollars, and then you'd have to go to the eighty nine cents, and you'd have to get all those charges and add them up oh manually. You had and and then once you did that, we had to handwrite a bank contract. Oh. Okay. Oh it wasn't gosh. like you okay. put it into some printer and it print. I was the damn printer because <laughs> I had legible handwriting or I, well, yeah, yeah. I had legible printing because I didn't, I don't know how to handwrite, but literally somebody would have, I mean, it would take forever. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine not having my big ADP printer beside me. And uh, yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine. I, I mean, think about it. If it was $5,773.89 and, or $773 and, 89 cents, and oh then, my God. And then back in those days, the only thing that anybody really sold was credit, life action, and health insurance. Well, mm -hmm. if you sold somebody on that, then you had to add all that up and see what your new oh. financed amount was. And then you'd have to start adding all those damn columns up again so that you could hand print another contract. Well, let me tell you, nobody was interested in selling anything at that point because who wanted to have to hand write another contract? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, oh, my gosh. I, I don't want to say you had it easy. <laughs> Okay, I think I did, Ray. <laughs> I think I did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you, you had you had some form of fax machine, whether it had been thermal paper or not. You had big yeah. ass printers that could that could actually print up a contract for you in a matter of moments. Yeah. Uh, uh, as opposed to me getting the cramp in my fingers as I was trying to write <laughs> the whole thing out. Uh, and God forbid you made an addition or anywhere on the contract, and it's like. Oh shit! I got to start over. <laughs> you know, it was those were some crazy times that I started in the business. Oh yes, yes, I do remember. Whenever I first started, and they again they threw me in at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, well, there was a um, a special finance manager. Okay. Okay, and he sat across the hall from me. Um, now, afterwards, of course, uh, after I learned how to be a finance manager, I learned what he was up yes. to because I remember he would browbeat people. They would come out of there in tears or sweating or or something. Special finance means you've got really bad yes. credit and he was able to get this done for you. But he made you take products and he wasn't the nicest guy about it. But Ray he had a huge Bible yeah. sitting on his desk um, thinking that that would make people feel better. I will never forget that. And then I found out years later that there were other special finance managers out there that would, it was a thing. I guess it was a trick that some F I don't know, but I'll never forget that. Uh, yeah. And, and, um, and special finance managers had a certain way about them. Like, this is oh. this is your car. Uh, I don't care that you don't like it. This is your. This is the only damn car the bank has approved Did you. you for? Okay, yeah. that's it. You're. I no. It, no, you can't get a four door. No, yeah. no, there will be no sunroof. You will like this two door with the vinyl interior. Trust me. And then yeah, and you come back in six months. 
and make all your payments and we'll do our best to get you out of it and put you into what you really want. And that's how they, mm-hmm. that's how special finance operated. It, it was very loose back in the day. Yes. That's for sure. Yes. And, and, and then there were some uh, special finance managers that really knew how to, to work the banks and really um, got people approved that should have never been approved for anything yeah. at all. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'll never forget. I worked with, I worked with a, uh, a finance manager one time and I, and I said, are we going to be able to do with anything with this guy? And he just looked at me and said, he couldn't finance the steam off a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> the steam off a hot dog. <laughs> and I, and I thought, oh my God. You have to be really bad not to be able to do that. <laughs> do, did you ever work at a time, and I did, unfortunately, um, where we actually, if somebody wanted a car and they didn't qualify for regular financing, we got them a, a second mortgage financing where, <laughs> where we used their house as collateral to... So they could qualify for the loan. So the house. Became, no, yeah. I never did that, but I have heard about yeah. that. Oh my God. Yeah. I, you know, this was, this was when I first started and I had no idea what was going on. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was, I, I was the greenest of green peas, but <laughs> they said, we got, we, we've got a way to make this happen for you. And, and they called in the, uh, the, the, the mortgage guy who, uh-huh. who wrote a second mortgage and oh my gosh yeah. why does that not surprise me coming from the mortgage industry yeah. that does not surprise me one bit yeah, and, and the people would have no idea that they just signed up for like a 15 year note to, mm, to, to mm. pay off oh their car gosh. you know which is really the note is attached to their house uh-huh. you know the car wasn't the collateral Oh my God. <laughs> the house was the collateral. Uh, you know, oh, it, Lord, I never dealt with that. Thank heavens. Well, I, I am, I am so thankful that you did not. It was, <laughs> you know, when I started in the late seventies, I, I was, I was green. I had, I had no idea. I, I, I didn't understand financing. I didn't understand mortgage. I didn't understand the car business, you know, and I, and I said whatever my managers told me to say, um, mm-hmm. Eventually, I, I wised up and learned a little stuff and figured out there's a better way to do things than just parrot thieves. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, gosh, can can I share another story that I can remember about an F and I manager? Sure, and, 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 I would love and that. see what it might trigger for you. Um, okay. I, I remember I remember walking to an F I manager's office one time, and he had uh, uh, IRS 1040 forms. I go, well, what are you working on? Are you doing your taxes? He goes, no, these aren't mine. I go, what are you oh. doing? He goes, well, the bank wants a tax return and, and uh, to match the income I said the customer had, so I'm producing the tax return. I said, what are you, out of your mind? He goes, well, he says, either I do it and get her bought or somebody else is going to do it and get her bought. I said, let somebody else do it and get her bought. I, I mean, you're really selling your soul for for a thousand dollar back end. Oh my gosh! That, oh my gosh, Ray. Yeah, I. I mean, you didn't ever see anybody doing any nonsense like. That. I did not. <laughs> I did not. You know what? I I think I remember the people the most. Yeah. You know, I remember people in my office, the customers, because you run in. You got to think. You're sitting in the office. You've got so many different characters coming in and sitting down in front of you on a daily mm-hmm. basis. And I, I, there is one that really, really, really stands out to me. I will never forget this one. And as you know, Ray, I'm a pretty sensitive person. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I can, I, I think, what do they call them? Uh, empathy pathetic person yeah yeah you get that feeling of the room you kind of feel the room well one night late um a a lady and her and her family came in and 
I'm going to make this a really short story because it's a long one. Oh, you can make and it long. We've got me, an hour today. So she gave me this very, very long story. So she, ha it was her and her husband and uh, a son and a daughter. They were teenage. Okay. And um, she came in and she gave me this very, very long story about having that you've seen this on television the mesh implants so you've seen the attorneys on television mm -hmm. this is many years yes. ago of course saying hey did you get a mesh implant sue your doctor if things go wrong okay and she tells me this long story about getting this mesh implant ray she shows me pictures oh my god now listen if she says to me if this if your stomach can handle it, i'm gonna show i'm like yeah yeah i got this i got this <laughs> so i'm looking at this horrid these horrid pictures yeah. and just my heart is pouring out to this woman. And at the end of the story, she says, and then I sued and I got three point whatever million dollars. Oh my of goodness. course, that's a lot of money to anybody, yeah. but especially back then, yeah. that was a lot of money. And uh, I said, oh my gosh. And she's just in tears. I mean, the emotion after this long, long story is just pouring out. Husband and kids sitting there listening to the whole thing. So I want to buy my family cars. Uh -huh. I want to buy my husband, my son, my daughter, myself. Okay, great. That's there's there. And then one for, oh my gosh, grandpa. Oh my. So grandpa got one too. Okay. So five cars. We have five cars, five cars, <clears throat> four of which are on the showroom floor. Oh my. Yeah. That's always fun. So that emptied our showroom yes. basically. And this is late at night and, um, uh, 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 products. Yeah. I want products on every single one of these what cars. Everything. So I want option a extended warranty paint. And I want it all. Okay. So she writes a check. Yeah for each one of these vehicles. Cause there's, as we know, they're separate transactions. Yep. She writes a check for each one of them. And guess what happened, right? Each one of those checks bounced one bounced higher than the other. One bounced <laughs> higher than the other. And I happened to, of course, you know what happens whenever the, um, the accounting office manager comes knocking on your, your finance office door. It's usually not good. <laughs> <laughs> It's never good. You don't want, Hey, Kimberly, the first check went through, um, it bounced. Yeah. So you might want to, you know, well, it happened to be written on a bank that I knew the person that was a manager at this bank. And I call him up. I'm like, Hey, can you check on that? Oh no, that person, they don't have an account here, but I can tell you one thing. That person has a history of doing this. So you better get your cars back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. and so we were off to the races um getting five cars back in the meantime giving her every opportunity to make it whole yeah you know like hey let's write a loan for you or uh you need to bring us some cash because uh your checks yeah. and then as this process was going on check number two bounce check number three but oh yeah, yeah. So it took us, it took us a week and we got all the cars back wow. unscathed. Um, but that, you know, that's something I'll never forget. My heart went out to this woman and to the extent that she, she went through to show me the pictures of her mesh implant that she got that created this, you know, point. <laughs> Five million dollar settlement and that she's got sitting in the bank oh she also showed us bank paperwork yeah. with the three with three million dollars sitting in it wow um so she went through some hoops too well you I'll know most con people are really good at conning other people <laughs> <laughs> and boy she got me she got yeah, me yeah. my heart went out to this woman yeah because uh, to, to this day the, those pictures she showed you probably weren't her <laughs> they were not her what i never understood was like her family the whole family sat there a family of con artists oh my gosh yeah oh my god that is that is quite the tale i i i remember 
in in Scottsdale, when I was at the Acura store and across the street from our Acura store was our uh, Porsche, Rolls Royce, and uh, Jaguar store. And we we had these young people. Uh, they came in and they were looking at NSXs at our store. And they're looking at Porsches across the street at the Porsche store. And it's, you know, this was in the early 2000s, 2001, maybe, you know, the internet boom had started and, you know, there were a lot of internet millionaires. And, and so the, these, these kids were con artists, um, and, oh yeah, we, we made all our money on this uh, website uh, and, oh yeah, the amount of clicks we're getting and the amount of money we're making. And they tried to buy three Porsches at the Porsche store and two NSXs at our store. And they had just printed up checks. Okay. On a non-existent bank account from a non-existent bank. And, and. My F and I manager, God bless her, she was ready to take them. I said, "What's the name on that account? What what bank? I've never heard of that bank. Can we look up and mm -hmm. see if that bank even exists?" Well, yeah. Ultimately, what happened is the three kids got arrested um, for for p passing bad checks and trying to commit fraud. Um, but it's it's. Your story just reminds me that there's con con artists everywhere, and they use whatever is available. At at the, I, I had a salesman, okay, who worked for me in Atlantic City. Who allegedly his wife was a former Canadian uh, ice skating champion, okay, and okay. and and he was from Philadelphia. And this was in the early 80s when there was a tremendous amount of mob violence in Philadelphia. Angelo Bruno was killed. Uh, a number of high-profile um, organized crime figures were, were killed. And mm -hmm. one of them was a fellow by the name of Phil Chicken Man Testa. And, and the way he died is um, they had put nails a nail bomb in his screen door so that when he opened the screen door, oh, the Lord. nail bomb exploded. Oh my gosh. And killed him. And, and my salesman the next day calls up. He says, well, I'm not going to be able to make it into work today. I go, well, well, why is that? He says, well, you know, it's so hard when you have to explain to, to your son, you know, how his grandfather got killed the night before by a nail bomb. Oh. Now, now, wait a Now, this guy wasn't even Italian, number one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure his Canadian figure skating champion <laughs> wife wasn't either Canadian or a figure skater. I mean, he just, he was so, he would just pull topical stuff out of the news and utilize it. I mean, yeah. And that was, a, yeah. you know, a, there was a con man that worked for me. As a salesperson, well, until until he pulled that stunt. Until, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it takes all kinds. It takes all kinds. Whether it be customers or the people we worked with. Yep. Okay. What, exactly. Yes. I mean, I, I had some lovely customers that, you know, were literally in organized crime. I mean, there was... You 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 know when when you watch a TV show uh, entitled "Confessions of of a Mob Boss" or a mob or whatever <laughs> it was, and and he was in the witness protection program, and all they would show was his eyes, and they said uh -huh. what his name was. He was my customer at the Nissan store. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean. You know, in the Atlantic City area during casino gaming when it first yeah. started, it, it was normal. It was, it's who you dealt with. They had money. Their money was good. We could get them loans. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many stories, like you said, with the customers as well as the people that we worked with. Did, did you have any times of just 
absolute silliness in the showroom? Never. We never had silliness in our showroom. Do you mean like when we wrapped everything in aluminum foil in somebody's office or filled their office with balloons so they couldn't open the door or you know, put peanut butter on their glass? <laughs> yes, yeah. we had lots and lots of silliness. I, I, I had at, at, at Admiral Nissan when it was Admiral Nissan and, and why the owner put up with me, I have no idea. But our parts manager's name was Dick Lucky. <laughs> hell of a name to have and and the parts department was the far end of the building away from the showroom and dick was like a silver fox gray hair but good looking piano player at night at the casino lounges and single and so dick said hey anytime there's a good looking woman in the showroom let me know well the way i used to let him know was I would get on the intercom system and I would go big dick in parts to the showroom, please. <laughs> I doubt, I doubt. I'm going to guess that part's probably going to get cut out, uh, I but doubt. that's freaking funny. Yeah. Oh my God. And, and it wasn't like the owner didn't hear it and it wasn't I, like it didn't oh. happen several times a week. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how he let me get away with that. <laughs> and and his son-in-law, Bobby, who was the co-general manager with me, I mean, we he was Admiral Bob. I was first mate Ray. We were we were big time <laughs> celebrities in a very small area. Um, and I remember one day we just started, he he poured water on me or something. And the next thing I knew, I grabbed the five gallon plastic water container off of the uh, off of the water machine, and I'm running around the showroom trying to trying to spray him with. I mean, it was just lunacy. We had well, listen. <clears throat> I don't think people. I know people don't realize this. Why? Because they show up at five minutes until you close. Yeah. But we have been there. <laughs> we don't work eight hour days no. with a one hour lunch. That just doesn't exist. Not in the at car car business. Yeah. No. And so we, we work what feels like 24 seven with the same people every day, especially sales managers and especially finance yeah. managers, because you got to stay until the last employee leaves or the last deal goes. And then after, so, you know, you gotta, you gotta come up with some fun times. Uh, yeah. There, there's gotta be something to make that long day worthwhile. Yeah. Um, and, and it wasn't always the paycheck. It was, oftentimes just the nonsense that that would yep. go on during the course of the day. I know as managers at the Nissan store, one Monday a month after work, we would actually all pile into a car and go into Atlantic City and we would go to our favorite Italian restaurant. It was called Colmones at that time. And we'd go have a late dinner and and just enjoy each other's company outside of the store where we had just spent 12 hours with each other already. Right. Um, you, that's right. Yeah. We did that too. Yeah. After work, we'd go spend, you know, five more hours together drinking and having fun yep. and eating and um, sometimes falling down steps and off of sidewalks. And, you know, we had a good time. <laughs> um, th that's one of the, one of the wonderful things about the car business is that it takes up so much of your time. But yet when you look back at it, most of the memories you tend to have are fond memories and, and, and not the memories of the times that were a giant pain in the ass. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I agree. I completely agree. You know, I, I made so many good friends that I yep. still remain friends with today, uh, from the yeah. car business. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't know. I, I, I wish I could have been around more for my kids. Um, of course, you know, um, and when I think of that, Ray, when I think about, you know, my son, um, listen, it, it kept a roof over our heads. Mm -hmm. It kept food on our plates. It allowed me to help my son get through schooling mm -hmm. and, um, and not want for anything. And, uh, yeah, it, it it's definitely a time suck. But at the same time, it it did all those things as well. Yeah, it's 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 a unique. It takes a unique breed of person to 
do what you did to do what I did to, to be involved in that type of atmosphere 12 hours a day. Um, Cause I'll never forget the owner at Admiral Nissan saying, he says, you're my eyes, you're my ears. We're open from nine in the morning till nine at night. Uh, you're off Tuesdays. Other than that, I expect you to be here. And yeah. we need to know what's going on. Okay, yeah. Herman, you got it. Um, and and you didn't think twice about it. You just you just did it, um, which was. I did a lot of complaining. Well, well, I think that's natural for anybody in the car business. I, I did. I did a lot of complaining yeah. right around the hours between seven and nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, so tired. Can I please go home now? And then, of course, that salesperson that would have that customer at a quarter till, well, you know, I, I didn't like that salesperson very much. No. It was like it was their fault. Well, yeah, but I'm sorry, Kimberly. I didn't, you know, but for, <laughs> but I could I could take it out on them, you know, like it was their fault. Um, but yeah, of course, yeah. the customer didn't want to be there that late with you either, right? Uh, right. I, I I will never forget when I, you know, I left the car business for a short period of time to have a golf store in Mesa, Arizona, and that golf store I went bankrupt, and so. The store closed, and prior to me closing the store, I got a job as a closer, a team chief, at at the Burge Volkswagen Mazda in Mesa, Arizona. And my first day on the job, we opened at 8 in the morning, and we closed at 9. So it was a 13-hour shift. Mm -hmm. Natalie, God bless her, was the finance manager. And... We had a late customer that we closed. Natalie got that customer about 10 o'clock at night. And I remember that we left the store about one o'clock in the morning because mm -hmm. Natalie was not going to let this customer go without them buying something or mm -hmm. everything. Oh, 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 yes. If you thought that you were going to do that, uh, you will pay yes. for it somehow. Yeah. yeah. So I always tell people, you know, maybe not do that. Yeah. Because and, and, and it was amazing to me. It was like these people were so proud of themselves that we're leaving at one o'clock in the morning and we'd been there since eight the previous morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking... They're, these people are nuts. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, Natalie, I appreciate the fact that you wanted to make something, but three hours to close the people to sign. And, and you know what happened? Eight o'clock in the following morning, they showed right back up saying, I don't want the warranty. I don't want this. I don't want that. Take it out or you can have the damn car back. Oh, oh that did not happen. No. Yeah, I was just. Listen, you know, Ray, I also remember, um, you know, where I live in the northern panhandle or the northeast panhandle here that we just don't have tornadoes. Yeah, we don't have tornadoes. You know, you'll get that crazy one every couple of years. Well, it was that time. Yeah. And there were sirens going off. There was my phone going beep, beep. <laughs> Do you think? that those people sitting in the chairs in front of me were even phased by the fact that we're sitting in a glass <laughs> building <laughs> and the wind is going, you know, a hundred miles an hour. Not at all. I said, you know, excuse me. This is, this is what would happen. You would get people in there that just have no clue. <laughs> like our life is in danger right now, but Let's make sure you get this signed, okay? Yeah, you know, and you know, if it were me, I would suggest you get credit life and accident insurance, accident health insurance, just in case I don't know, a tree falls on you when you walk out of here tonight. <laughs> that is something I'll never forget. Yeah. I will never forget that. Yeah, it it there there are times that customers seem oblivious. There are times that salespeople and managers can seem oblivious. Yeah. Um, and and even with all those times, I don't know that I would trade it for anything in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it went by really quick, too. It did. Whenever you look back, you, it went slow. Those days, 
you know, but now I look back on it and oh my gosh, it went so fast. Hey, Kimberly, can you do me one small favor? Yeah. Can you share with people what you're doing today and how, I don't know, they might be able to follow what it is that you're doing and, and, and well, how they yeah. can, how they can educate themselves by following what it is that you're doing. I absolutely can. So I, and I get asked this a lot, like, are you still working at the dealer? No, I, I left the dealership late 2019. Uh, this was after I got my kid through school and, um, and I was tired. Mm -hmm. And so I left, but immediately after Ray, I started helping, um, my son's friends. Yes. Oh my gosh, don't do this. Oh, you have to do that. And the next thing you know, I'm on the phone with them while they're in front of the finance manager. And then my family's doing the same thing. And I just had this, this is what I must do is help people through the finance mm -hmm. office at the dealership. And so then I found Car Edge. I found you and I found Zach right when I was about ready to go down the path of a little YouTube channel that I now have, yes. which is called Auto Finance Sense, where I help people through the second half of the deal, which is the finance office. Absolutely. And, and the finance office is where um, a big chunk of the, of the dealership's profits are expected to be made. And, and that is, yep. and, and saying that that's, I'm not saying that in a bad way. And I'm not saying that a lot of the products that they offer are bad products. They, they are not necessarily bad products. Um, but you help people understand what products actually have value for them and, and what that value is in relation to real dollars and cents. And I, I think that is such a noble thing that you're doing to, uh, help educate the public out there. I mean, you, as you know, when you were part of courage, that that's our big thing is uh, yeah. knowledge is power or applied knowledge is power. And you got it. Yeah. And you're, and you're, you know, you're, you're still doing it today. Uh, and, and they can find you at uh, auto finance sense.com. Well, not quite yet. Okay. I've got the dot com, but my YouTube channel okay. is Auto Finance Sense S E N S E, and um, yeah, that's that's just where I help people understand these things because this is what I hear on the daily. But I started this because people say I did so good on the front, yes. but it's, they got me in the finance office. And that's where I want to help save you thousands of dollars. Well, bless you for that. And, and bless you for being a part of our auto insiders today. I, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time out of your day to share, um, well, such wonderful stories with us. I hope, <laughs> I hope our viewers, um, get as much of a kick out of the stories as, as I did hearing yours and while well, sharing mine. Um, yeah. and, and, and God knows there's probably, I don't know, another seven Ray, hours worth of stories. How many, <laughs> let me ask you, Ray, how many times have you said, cause I think we all have in the auto industry, I could write a book. Oh yeah. I could write a book yeah. about stories from the dealership. Yeah. I could do a stand up routine about stories of the dealership. Uh, yeah. 100%. Yes. Um, and, 100%. and lucky for me because of my son, I actually get to do like a sit down routine and, yeah. uh, and I get to do it in video and live stream form, but it, it, it is the most unusual and unique industry to work in. Mm -hmm. And it is the most unusual and devastating industry for, for non-industry insiders to understand, for consumers to understand, and and for you to be there to help them through that part of it, I can't thank you enough for that. Oh, thank you, Ray. I love, you know how much I love Car Edge. I love Car Edge. Um, I love what they do. They are the only ones out there helping people through the car buying process genuinely. And boy, was I fortunate to come, apro come across you and Zach. Um, I, I can't say, I love Car Edge. Well, go to Car Edge. If you want genuine, caring people to help you, go to Car Edge. It was, it was meant to be. It was kismet at the time. <laughs>
We were, it was. We were, we were all meant to be part of that together. And we thank you for that. And I yeah. thank you for today. And, and, thank you. and you have a standing invitation to come back anytime. And if there's anything that I can do, um, or courage can do to help you, you know, we're here for you and we'll always do thank everything you, we can for you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Thank you, Ray. You have a good evening. You too.